Okay. Yeah, yeah, here we go. We good? All right. Uh, Welcome back. Health Tech Night Episode 2. Episode 2. Oh, uh, man. Here Love with it. Chris and Connor today. Um, yeah, the first episode was really good. So, obviously, uh, we're back here doing Episode 2. Um, you know, for those of you who never watched Episode 1, uh, just an introduction to Health Tech Nights. Um, which was an in-person meetup that we started in Victoria last year, um, now evolving into uh, like a podcast as well, just to keep everybody connected between the meetups. Um, our topic is health tech, so um, attracting people that are that work in healthcare, work in technology, work in startups in in health tech. Um, and uh, the whole reason we started health tech, health tech night, was uh, trying to you know get co-founders to meet and maybe start the next great health tech startup in in victoria and uh in canada so uh, i just wanted to comment on the first episode went really well uh chris how many how many, how many views do we get i think when i check before we're up to 234 so uh <laughs> not too bad for the first one not, that we're, not that we're counting so uh, <laughs> not that we're describing. i gotta say i think this is hilarious the the day after the three of us just texting back and forth like giddy little school kids every new view was just awesome so even if you know you're you haven't watched it yet or you you have thank you because uh, it certainly made my day and i know that the three of us had uh, some pretty funny conversations after that so yeah, yeah no, no doubt if you can find it in yourself to comment on the uh, on the video that also would make our day so uh <laughs> Don't worry, we respond to all the comments we get. Uh, yeah. So far, we, we got one comment. So uh, One comment? Yeah. Nice. You know, well, I know I've got a up. bunch of emails <laughs> and LinkedIn <laughs> messages after the post, and people are already giving ideas on who we should interview and where we should go. So I think it's uh, it's been well-received so far. So if you do have anything, uh, subscribe, right? That's what podcasters say. Subscribe below. Yep. Um, and uh, definitely let us know if you guys have any comments or, uh, or topics that you want us to cover. But real excited to get this going. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, brings us to introducing our uh, first guest on the podcast, Connor Edwards. Um, Connor, you can hey give your spiel. Hey guys, well thanks for having me and uh, congrats on the podcast and also uh, the Health Tech Nights. I, I met Chris there, so yeah. uh, that's one connection. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch more, so really liked it so far. Um, my name is Connor Edwards, um, originally from Victoria, uh, grew up here uh, first taste of tech was working at an early stage company called Hootsuite in Vancouver and then uh, moved to, to Toronto and worked in consulting and banking and then for the last five years have been an early stage investor uh, in B2B software, fintech and digital health companies. So uh, looking forward to being on the, the pod today. It's a, it's a milestone. First ever podcast guest. So Thank you. Uh, like I said to you before, down in the Health Tech Nights podcast hall of fame forever. Look, yeah, you're, yeah, you're legitimizing us right now. Yeah, so I'm, trying, I'm trying to set it. the bar high here. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming on. Um, you know, I think this is like uh, for from the founder perspective, like getting the getting the investor perspective is kind of like a rare, you yeah. know, rare glimpse on the other side. And like, yeah. uh, going to be interesting to talk to you about like you know what VCs are looking for, and like even a little bit about. The current state of the VC market in Canada, yeah. um, you know, and what what founders are hoping to you know see from VCs in twenty twenty three. How would you summarize the market as of right now? You know, I think it's a funny time right now. I think um, there's a lot of uncertainty both on a macro perspective and then uh, and then how that trickles down to, to venture. So um, you know, no one has a crystal ball right now, but it's uh, it's certainly an interesting time. Yeah, the, the macro picture is like quite yeah. interesting, hey? Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people are don't really think about the the dominoes that fall, but, um, you know, interest rate hikes in February 2022, yep. yeah. um, kind of an unprecedented amount of interest rate hikes, um, which is re- leading a lot of investors to, you know, invest in safer assets other than yeah. VC. They don't necessarily need to chase that yield because... You get GICs and Treasury bonds that are all yielding like five yeah. percent, which is pretty good. And inflation's yep. starting to come down. So, um, you know, what's with in the face of un- economic uncertainty? Like, what's the reason a lot of people would it, invest in venture right now? And I think that's that's kind of what we're seeing at like the on the investor side, right? We're just not seeing the money flow. And uh, VC investing in North America was down sixty three percent Q four twenty twenty two. And uh, we heard from somebody at uh, SVB that it was down even more than that mm. um, in Canada. So, like an amazingly huge contraction. Um, and uh, the quote from the person we spoke to at Silicon Valley Bank said, 
Uh, they always thought VC would slow down in uh, 2022, 2023, but this was a pace far faster um, than they ever anticipated. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, we're, we're definitely starting to see that on, uh, on, the, on the VC side and companies trying to raise and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, I've got a blog post here from Chris Newman, who's a general partner at Panache. And uh, I, th I thought this was a great, this was on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, I thought this was super interesting. Um, it talks a little bit about the state of VC in Canada and uh, you know if people can bear with me. Uh, I'll just start reading it and sure. uh, see where we go from there. Okay. Uh, so Canada, Canada can't afford to f a flight to fear. As 2023 kicks off and industry-wide funding pullback is in full effect, VC investing in North America was down a whopping 63% in Q4 2022 year over year, and now the VC echo chamber is trumpeting far and wide about the impending, quote, flight to quality. Merritt Hummer of Bain Capital Ventures defined this phenomenon as follows. A flight to quality for the venture industry means a reversion to revenue models that are profitable and predictable. Broadly speaking, a flight to quality refers to a consolidation of resources towards companies that are considered to be of higher quality and thus lower risk. In the startup world, companies that are seen to be of higher quality will find themselves attracting a higher share of venture capital dollars in 2023, while others struggle to raise. But what is, quote, quality? In Merritt's definition, quality is defined in terms of a company's revenue model, not the company itself. This distinction is important since the vast majority of high growth startups do not become profitable until many years in. True innovation takes time and money, which is why venture capital exists in the first place. Thus, a flight to quality in venture capital does not and should not be interpreted as a flight to profitable or near profitable companies only. Unfortunately, in companies outside of the US, that's often the case. A bit of history. Like most companies, like most countries not named America, Canadians, Canada's venture capital industry evolved from a traditional investment banking and later stage private equity. In contrast to the inherently risk-taking approach of U.S. venture capital firms, the origins of which you can learn about in the excellent book, VC in American History, most early Canadian VC firms historically relied on spreadsheets, numbers, and traction to make investment decisions. The predictable result was a deeply conservative industry in stark contrast to our neighbors to the south. The American approach to venture capital has its roots in the 18th century whaling. A colliery, a colliery of top-down evolution of venture capital in Canada was the emergence of an industry far more focused on late-stage investing than is found in the U.S. Canada has plenty of investors who are willing to jump on board once a company has product market fit, but at the pre-seed pre stage, there are embarrassingly few VCs, few VC firms across the country. To be clear, Canada's venture industry has matured significantly over the years. Today, there are many more early stage firms than there were 20 years ago, but that number remains frighteningly low. So while Canada's tech industry has reached unprecedented heights in recent years, our innovation pipeline is at serious risk of catastrophic slowdown if more than a handful of those investors flee the risk taking necessary in pre-seed and early seed for safer waters. The challenge. Last time we faced a real pullback in VC was in 2008 following the US housing crisis. For those keeping score, that's 15 years ago. Plenty of investors are pontificating on Twitter about how great companies are founded in tough markets, but the reality is many of them have never seen a bear market, much less invested in one. Many of today's investors have only ever known a world where follow on funding was relatively easy to come by. A world in which many of their companies were able to raise subsequent rounds even if they missed their numbers, including, heaven forbid, investments where investors glossed over diligence or FOMO'd into a bad deal. Now those same investors are at a crossroads. Do they continue to invest in risky pre-revenue, pre-product market fit startups, or become more conservative and wait till there are more numbers to analyze? For a VC who hasn't experienced a bear market before, it can be very tempting to give into fear and flee to the safety of numbers. When times get tough, the siren song is to go upstream. <clears throat> Invest in later stage companies where investment decisions require less subjectivity becomes loud. All the more so if the firm is relatively unproven and some of their early window winners are suddenly looking like duds. In the US, there are so many VC firms that dozens or even hundreds of individual investors could move upstream without meaningfully impacting the ecosystem. It happens all the time. 
But in Canada, if more than a handful of our preciously few early stage investors abandon pre-seed, then there will be no startups to invest in at that later stage. That's how precipitous our position is right now. You might think that I'm overreading, but as I sit here in Vancouver, I can literally count on one hand the number of VCs in my city who are actively writing pre-seed checks. Even if one of us pulls back from investing, the long-term impact would be significant. The opportunity. As much as we talk about great companies being founded in tough markets, it's also true that great investors are forged in difficult times. Some of the best performing early stage funds of all time were from the, are from the last recession, 2008 to 2011 vintage. The problem is the short-term incentives for venture firms can drive individual investors to make more, uh, to more conservative behavior when times get tough. When capital is, is scarce, VCs can still make a lot of money by being safe, quote, okay allocators of capital rather than leaning into the opportunity to be great and risk managing and risk making mistakes. The reality is that while becoming more, a more conservative investor can give the illusion of a short-term safety net, over time the returns of conservative funds revert to the mean. The performance of such firms become more and more mediocre as vintage-defining outliers emerge in the portfolios of investors who are willing to take risks. Marvin Liao, who has investments in more than 400 early-stage startups around the world, recently noted, it's pretty safe and easy to just invest, invest on traction or the second or third time successful founder. This is unsurprisingly the strategy for many established VC funds and angel investors. And this is also why many of them don't drive good returns on their investments. So as we look ahead to 2023, here's to hoping that Canada's early stage investors continue to take risks and support our country's most ambitious founders. Our country simply can't afford a flight to fear and we won't own the podium if we do, uh, if we don't take shots. Long blog post. Is that right? Yeah. 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 What do you guys think? There was a lot to a lot to unpack there. Yeah. No, I'm I'm curious to hear your just initial thoughts before we dive into some yeah, questions. Yeah. I mean, uh, you look. I think I agree with Chris. I think he's uh, he's articulated that um, well. That. Uh, yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of people. There's a lot of venture firms in Canada that it's a it's a less mature market than the U.S. and and, and a lot of firms are just being built and and um, as as part of that, you know, the the partners are younger and they haven't been through those those downturns and they're still building firms and and so um, you know they have to think about how they're building that firm, how they're going to raise another fund, and and um, if they made a bunch of investments that are going to have markdowns um, uh, in the not too distant future or already have, then um, you know, that's something that they have to consider, they are considering, and you know, whether that's right or wrong, don't know, but um, but yeah, I, I agree with Chris. It's funny when you, uh, what I didn't really realize about VCs yeah. was uh, they're in very similar positions to the startup founders. You know, they're having to go out there and pitch LPs in a very similar way yeah. to the CEOs of VC-backed companies. And uh, you know, they get a lot of no's um, as well, right? So. Uh, they're having to appease their LPs very much in a so in a very similar way to the founders having to appease the VCs, um, and if anything, like it's it's an even longer relationship because those LPs might follow them into you know multiple funds. That fund could take a decade to wrap up. Yeah. Um, they're releasing like regular reports, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and uh, and there's probably like there's probably less high net worth, large institutional LPs than there are investors or VCs out there, right? So like each one of those relationships definitely is like very, very valuable to, to those investors. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, part of it is is understanding how um, LPs uh, work as well, right? So they're, you know, managing pools of capital that could be different types of asset classes and, you know, they have to balance their portfolio and um, allocations to each type of asset class um, as well, right? So if, if, they had an outsized um, allocation to venture. They need to kind of rebalance, and and that's they call that the the, the denominator effect. And so, um, you know, that's something that they have to consider too. So certainly, it's part of uh, you have to, 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 to. I think as a founder, if you're looking to raise capital, it's it's important to understand you know how the venture fund works as well. So uh, because there's been a pull up, pullback in the public markets, and this is what this is was like kind of what everyone was talking about early 2022, but. Because there was a big pullback in the public markets, a lot of the LPs found themselves overweight venture. That's right. Yeah. Um, which means like venture firms either had to mark down their investments, or the public markets had to return 
Um, but in the interim, those LPs were not making additional uh bets in VC because they were overweighted in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's more realistic that they wouldn't uh yeah, they they're not making any additional commitments or or you know, maybe the pacing of those commitments changes. Yeah. How, how do you find, you know, this uh applying to the healthcare sector because it's always seen as a more risky investment, longer time yeah. to get a return. Um curious on thoughts on on how this uh, applies there. Yeah, you know, I think um I think for for digital health companies or health tech in general, I think first of all there's a number of different types of health tech companies, right? And so you know whether you have a regulatory path or not, or finding that right type of investor is important because how they're going to approach the market right now uh, is going to vary depending on that type of investor, in, in my opinion. So um, I think that's that's the key there is really to understand a what kind of business are you? Are you a product business? Are you a tech enabled service business? You know, and those types of investors change. So, and that I think gets amplified in in times like these. And, and is there something that the companies themselves can do to make it, I don't say easier, but uh, yeah. to make it easier for the the investors in this time to say like, what kind of information are they going to be looking for? Yeah, I mean, I um, I think really like it, it's it's going to depend on the type of business it is, and so. Um, you know, whether it's being able to turn on those unit economics and growth, you know, for a while there, it was always growth at all costs, right? And that's some of the uh, things that Chris was referring to in the article was, um, you know, is this, is it growth at all costs? Or can you turn on and off that profitability piece, right? Or at least a path towards it, you know? And that's, I think, something that investors are going to be looking for. If it's a health tech business, you know, that could be like a milestone base, depending on what kind of business it is. Um you know, I think I think those are some of the key considerations right now. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, it, it's funny in, in this blog post, uh, it talks a lot about there's no shortage of investors that are willing to jump on at a later stage. What, what do you think is wrong with like early stage investors in Canada or what's wrong with the market? And like, why are we not attracting those investors? Is it like, is it the way the incentives are set up for taxes? Is there not enough risk capital in Canada? Is there no LPs that are looking for those kind of early stage type investments? Like, what what are your thoughts there? Uh, yeah, I think there's not enough early stage investors in Canada, and it, and it varies on where in Canada too, right? So, you know, we're in we're in BC right now. Um, you know, less investors here than there are in Toronto, for example. So, uh, I think it depends on you know, there's there needs to be more of them. There needs to be more LPs. There's not, you know, in the U.S. they have this large kind of family office, um, really really wealthy kind of individuals or. Or families that are willing to kind of back early stage uh, emerging managers, and that just doesn't happen here in Canada as much. Um, so, you know, could be a tax issue as well. That's that's something that they have in the states as well, more favorable taxes. Um, but um, yeah, I think there just needs to be more early stage investors, and and it's hard to do that right now given where the market is. But it's it's something that I think we you know as an ecosystem we should all kind of be working towards. And, and what would you say are, are some of the things that as an ecosystem we, we can do? Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of it's around education too. Like I think just educating, um, you know, people that may be interested in private investing in, in, in terms of venture, um, have no exposure to it and just giving those opportunities and, and showing like how, how to get involved, what, what does a fund life look like, um, those types of things. That's... That's probably the first place to start um, as an ecosystem, and and you know that that's uh, I think there's a number of people trying to do that, but um, still a lot of work to be done. You did talk about the education that's required. I think if we take a look at you know the companies that are hopefully listening to this and sort of building the next generation of angel investors, as an example, what do you recommend somebody would do to start educating themselves so that eventually we can build enough of an educated population to start some investment uh so, so founders mean like what, whether uh, it's founders yeah. or angels like i look at someone like myself yeah, right like i've yeah, been yeah. in the digital health space I, yeah. I talk to companies all the time i have an interest not to say that i'm going to create like a vc yeah. or anything like that but you know if if vcs are less likely to invest right now given the risk but there's people out there that have an interest in understanding of digital health yeah how do they start yeah i, I think um if if you're if you're able to obviously this is financial advice at all but I mean if you if you can invest in those companies and and you know 
Uh, if you have a network and access to a, you know a number of companies that you think you know in your space that you think are good investments, um, that's definitely somewhere to start as an angel, right? And you can do that um, by joining a, a syndicate or something, or or uh, you know a local group. Or uh, there's a, there's a number of ways you can you can get involved with with uh, angel investing. And I think there needs to be there's there's a good I think robust group of angels, um, certainly in in Toronto and also out out west as well. Um, you know, my, my opinion is there needs to be more kind of institutional money at that, that earliest stage, the pre-seed and seed stage, um, in, in the funds. Like, I think there's a good angel network, and some of those angels may want to be LPs in new funds. And I think there just needs to be more more of those. And anything we haven't touched on that you wanted to kind of touch on or? No, no. I think, I think important. Um, no, I, I think I think that's good. I think for, for founders out there, I think this is a great time to be starting a company. Like, I think that's that's one thing I'd say is I, I think... Um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of great f- companies being founded. Uh, it's hopefully more digital health companies being founded uh, in these times, right? Whether it's a someone who's seen a problem in in, in tech and maybe they're uh, you know out of a job and 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 looking to to build something. I think this is a great time, and you know there are the best deals. I think still are getting funded too. So um, you know, I, I'd say I'm looking forward to the next kind of few years of of digital health investing. What, what do you think is going to happen in the next few years, like when we do ultimately come out of this recession? A, how long do you think it's going to last for? And then B, like what's what's the environment going to look yeah, like? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to make a, a, a I'm not going to, it's going to be a completely guess, right? Yeah, for, let, for, let's, hear your, <laughs> let's hear your best guess. I, I think we're at least, you know, at least three more quarters of, of, of pain right like at least you know and that could be dependent on a whole bunch of other geopolitical things or whatever um but i I think the next year will be will be tough time but i think that's a great time to build be building something right there's no expectation of well they're they're you know for some investors there may be an expectation of revenue for for a very very early stage company but you know hopefully the best investors aren't looking for that on day one if you know if you can't if you uh, if you don't have it, I think that's most investors understand that that's okay because um, building companies take some time, and so yeah, I think this is a great time to be building companies and and hopefully more digital tech companies. Digital do you, you think that the investors are looking at health companies in a different way, like especially from the revenue perspective, right? Like even in the article, it talked about the you know that you need to have like the business model or the yeah. the payer, but in healthcare, that's not always yeah uh, easy to get there. Um, are they looking at them differently? And if so, what are some of the core things from a founder perspective that an investor might want to see? You know, I think there's a, a lot of investors, especially in venture, that are used to kind of SaaS businesses, right? And particularly in Canada, right? We don't have a number of specialized firms. We have a lot of generalists. I think we're, as a nation, very much generalists. So, um, you know, in the U.S., they have so much you know, population and, and capital to kind of specialize and, and we don't have that here. So I think as a founder, you have to really understand your audience and know who you're talking to. So if you're talking to an investor that is a generalist, then you might need to spend a little bit more time up front um, and try to educate them on health tech and, and what your business does and what are, you know, explain to me like I'm five, that, that kind of level of, uh, of, of education. You know, if you're talking to a firm uh, that's used to a tech-enabled service business that's, you know, invested in a number of health tech companies, then you may not have to do that type of education. So I think it really depends on the stage of the company, who you're talking to, and uh, and what that investor uh, invests in. Okay. And as a, uh, you know, someone that obviously works with companies a lot, um, advice in terms of, you know, starting in the Canadian market, going down to the U.S., if, you know, especially in a time like this yeah. where resources are, are tight, where should you start as a founder? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there can be a Canadian only digital health company. So I, I think that we've we've seen that with, you know, companies like Maple and Dialog and, and, and others where there's a few markets. Mo- the, mo- the biggest criticism about Canada is the market's too small. And, and I think for the most part, that's right. But in certain um in certain industries, whether it's prop tech or fintech or maybe even health tech, um, you can build a Canadian-only company. Um, but again, it's going to depend on the investor, and it, it doesn't don't base your business on how the investor looks at it. But it depends on which kind of investors are the best investors for you. Um, so if you are talking to a U.S. investor and you have no traction in the U.S., um, that's a bit of a hard sell, 
because um, they're they're going to naturally want to see the market or see the, the product and try the product. Right. And if they can't do that, that's 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 tough. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the U.S. is a huge market, and so if you can get to the U.S. fast, then great. But if your product's applicable to Canada, um, certain companies can make that work. Uh, certain certain companies can't. So it really depends is, is the best answer. For sure. So uh, kind of getting back to the VC winter for a second. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that there might be like a bit of a, like a long tail risk here yep. that people aren't really considering. But if you have a bunch of founders that are now coming up in this kind of capital starved environment, um, the parts of venture back companies that used to take the most capital was building products, advertising, um, and what used to be a super capital intensive process is, is no longer that with integrations and no code, low code, Zapier, bubble, yep. whatever, right? Um, do you think we're going to see a lot of founders that don't become reliant on VC? Um, so the so the lack of pre-seed and seed companies will just force the founders a different direction, um, which might even starve some of the later stage investors in Canada in the long run. Yeah, it, it, that's an interesting that's an interesting um, point of view. I, I think uh, I, I think taking venture dollars is is um, is a, a a path. You know, not that's not the right path for every business and and. You have to kind of be. Un- you have to understand what you're signing up to when you do take investment from, uh, invest from VCs because, you know they like you said they have and, and like um, Chris's article mentioned you know they have other investors and they have their own investors like limited partners and and so understanding that model is something that's that's key and so, um, you know you can build a perfectly great business without taking any VC dollars and that's totally fine. It's just a different trajectory maybe and it's a different type of business and uh i think that's up to the founder to understand and and really uh, make a decision what's right for them so i I don't think i don't know if it's gonna starve you know i think there are going to be a ton of companies that still want to raise money from from venture funds Mm -hmm. um i I don't i don't necessarily think that's going to starve kind of later stage capital i think i think what it is going to do is just make make founders you know, uh, capital maybe wasn't as scarce as, uh, or you know, as it was you know a few years ago, and so it's just gonna be, pe- you know, I think it's gonna make people more focused and, and better founders. Anything else you wanted to add, or things we didn't touch on that uh, you wanted to touch on? Uh, no, I think we I think we covered a lot here. I think uh, it's, again, good time to build companies. I think it's uh, hard to raise money, but um, I think the best companies or deals are still getting done, and so um, I'm looking forward to the next couple of years because. Uh, like Chris said, some of the best vintage funds and best performing companies come out of these hard times. No, appreciate it. We'll have you back in nine months and see how sounds many good. of these uh, predictions we had came true. Yeah, sounds good, guys. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Sweet. Uh,